and we've only been part of this landscape for a tiny blip of time. And you have to fill that void with your respect. And it's not just a commodity that you can buy and sell and trade. We're trying to be part of this landscape again. How does being by a Jeffrey Pine make you feel? And when I sit with people that share those values, it really makes me feel like I belong to this community. There's an experience that happened in my life where I went hunting. You know, there was a salmon, there was a deer, there was these animals, and my friend told me the story about, hey, when you take something from the land, you create a void, and you have to fill that void with your respect. But he didn't say define respect. He said, well, what does that mean to you? And so as I went on with my life, I realized that I had to give back, and what was I gonna do? And I started teaching kids, and I realized, well, this is a great way to give back, to fulfill that cyclical thing of giving back to nature. Muck, muck, muck. Muck out. Muck. We're in the business of land health, and uh, we use animals as our primary tool for creating healthy landscapes. And one of our big pushes is a land ethic creating a relationship with the landscape, trying to look at the land and see what it's telling us it needs, and trying to figure out how we can work with it. The land gives to us and gives us a means to live, and by us giving back to it and improve it, it's just gonna make it better for us and the landscape. It's kind of like a give and take relationship. Well, the land inspires me every day. If it's just me going out and listening to the sounds or feeling the texture of the bark or running my hand across a stump and, and just realizing that we're only here for an instant and sharing that with others, this celebration of the environment through art. The biggest thing is to realize that we're not as smart as we think we are and we've only uh, been part of this landscape for a tiny blip of time. And the earth took care of itself a long time before we got in the way. So if you want to figure out what's the right thing to do, kind of take a look at uh, how it was done before uh, man got involved and screwed it all up. And look at uh, Mother Nature and how she took care of herself and mimic those methods. What we're mandated to do as indigenous people here, the Nisenan people, we're supposed to tend to the land and tend to our dead. And to belong, it's very difficult because we don't have land to go and do these things anymore. We don't have access to all but one of our burning grounds. I feel more like a visitor. I've been here, yeah, <laughs> almost half a century on this piece of ground. And I, I guess it is a belonging, because uh, it doesn't belong to me, I belong to it. So we decided to make digging sticks with the kids. And we went out to go harvest these sticks. And when we got back, the kids were like, oh, this is mine. And I asked the kid, well, how come all of a sudden this has been growing here for 10, 15 years? Why all of a sudden, just because you take it, it becomes yours? My version of a land ethic is admitting that the land is a community to which you belong, and it's not just a commodity that you can buy and sell and trade. It's a living, working, multifaceted, crazy thing that we're just trying to be a part of and hopefully improve. I thought I was an environmentalist. Well, I still am an environmentalist. But I was of the mindset that if you cut one tree, you were doing something wrong. Well, I've learned a lot in my 16 years here. And I realize that the best thing that we can do for this place is to remove a bunch of trees because there's way more trees here now than there were back under the previous management, which was the Native Americans. We are the stewards of this place and we're supposed to burn the land with fire to take care of it and keep the bugs away and keep our trees healthy and bendable and pliable and new and fresh. Forest is not supposed to have mown grass and trimmed hedges. There's change that occurs, and we tend to not like change. And the most dramatic change that we've affected is fire. And we've said, oh, this is terrible. We can't have scorched trees and black on the bark when that's part of the natural cycle. 
we need to totally rethink wood and how we can use it because it's not something that is an opportunistic thing. It's not something, well, I have this business and I need wood to feed it. What we have is we have the wood and we need something to do with it because without that, we won't be able to get the restructuring done in a way that allows us to finish these restoration processes, which is to get fire back on the landscape. And there has been times where I think, hmm, I am a newcomer here. However, you know, in a way we're part of this whole landscape here. Because without all this landscape here, like the trees and the rocks and the water, we wouldn't be here either. So when we can feel like, hey, we are a part of that, wherever we do go in a way, we can become a part of that place. And that place becomes a part of us. I was born here at the Empire Mine Cabin my granddad built back around 1905. My mom and dad came over my mom was about 1924, and my dad probably came over with the granddad in 1905. That was the early days where people were getting in and out of the country a little easier here. So my third great grandfather, Pamela, was a shaman, and that is a Western term. So for our holy people, we called them uh, Yom, and so he was a great leader, so he was Yom and Hook. If you want to talk about documented bloodlines or genealogy, from my daughter, she is eighth generation from around the Gold Rush era. So my daughter, Lorena, and that comes to myself, then my mom, Ginger, her father, Dutch, his mother, Mary, and her mother, Mary, and then her father, Pamela. And Pamela was a junior, so he came from a long line of leaders, and his father was also Pamela. A place draws you in to create art. The place inspires the art. It is a site-specific work. And creating artwork to craft around that landscape is what I do. And just closing your eyes just for a minute and listening to all the beauty that's around you, the stream in the background, the rustling of the aspen trees that you might hear. I think like many people in the county, I've had to reinvent myself. And so my sense of purpose the last 10 years has really been about motivating people to feel great. And I've been able to do that in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways is gathering people in the community that have common interests around food and farming and supporting local food and farming businesses. And that gives me a great deal of pleasure and purpose. And when I sit with people that share those values, it really makes me feel like I belong to this community. I have great hope for the Nisenan. I hope that we will win our federal restoration case and I hope that maybe someday we'll have land again of our own where we can go and continue our ceremonies and our culture in the way that we're supposed to carry them on. I feel that I belong in Nevada County because of its community, because of the vibrancy of that community, uh, that it's really a visionary creative, caring community. What fascinates me most is that there's a belief that we can change the world for better and that we're actually out here trying to do it. <laughs>